ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله ونشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاه والسلام على سيد المرسلين اما بعد رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي امين يا رب so as i was saying this hadith is a hadith that is famously known as the hadith of umm zarra the hadith of umm zarra and this hadith is in the version that we will be studying today is in sahih muslim even though i will be referring to the other versions also uh and this is a conversation between the prophet and aisha radiyallahu anha it's one of the longer uh, hadiths recorded that sahih it's it's actually very long as you'll see uh it's a very long hadith of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and it is a conversation between the prophet and aisha and it's a romantic conversation but it's not just a romantic conversation it is a conversation in which the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam ultimately is trying to express his love for Aisha but the way and the style and the the mechanism that the prophet uses to explain his love for Aisha is by giving this elaborate you can say picture conversation and the setting of this hadith is basically that as i will read from the hadith qalat aisha radiyallahu anha qalat jalasa ihda ashara imra'atun so 11 and this is the prophet now mentioning this and Aisha is narrating this hadith that 11 women 11 wives were sitting together okay and so what were they what did they do now the prophet's telling this to Aisha to explain his love but before we go into that part because that'll come back at the end but it's very interesting how the prophet mentions and you know I was saying that this hadith can also be called the hadith of the flaws of men the hadith of the flaws of men this hadith is very allegorical it's one of the most difficult hadith to understand what its intent and its meanings are because the prophet and you know if you notice also very interestingly enough is that the prophet's using very difficult language in this hadith i mean he's talking in parables like shakespeare he's talking in very difficult language with Aisha and between Aisha and the prophet they're able to understand the prophet's able to say these difficult things and Aisha is grasping what the prophet is saying immediately and so the conversation starts by the prophet saying jalasa ihda ashara imra'atun 11 women were sitting together so what did they do they probably knew each other in this parable fata'ahadna wa ta'aqadna an la yuktab so they all promised each other look we're all going to promise we will reveal everything about our husbands we're not going to hide anything right any flaws anything anything good anything bad we're going to tell each other about it to each other Now this is the story that the prophet's telling Aisha this happened now when did this happen this event we don't know it was either the prophet is giving this as an example of uh, the point he's making or because some of the narrations actually mention names for some of these women so maybe this was an event that actually happened and then it came as a wahi to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in which the prophet then narrated this hadith to the prophet this event to the prophet that 11 women were sitting and then they said this and therefore my love for you o aisha is this okay uh, there is some discussion amongst the ulama about the fact that why would the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam mention uh the uh, things that he is mentioning here in terms of Uh, this woman said this and this woman said this and this woman said this this was not the intent and the names are for the most part not known they're all hidden yani the main thing is to give the lesson like you know the quran like mentions abu lahab and firaun and so on and so forth so that is the main intent and this conversation most likely took place in jahiliya most likely took place in the time of jahiliya amongst uh different uh women that were sitting together 
Okay, so uh, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam So the first wife. Now we're going to go through how many wives? Eleven, Eleven wives. And in these, this is just the big. Uh, this is just. There's actually more than that because you have to bring the Prophet and Aisha at the end. Okay, so the first one says. قالت أولى زوجي لحم لحم my 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 husband is like a meat but what type of meat غثة غثة means valueless doesn't have any value that is he's like meat that is put on top of the mountain and then she says على رأس الجبال وأرى ولا سحل يترقي ولا يسمين so she says that I have to climb this mountain all the way up to get it. And I can't even bring down the whole meat. I have to bring it piece by piece by piece. So what was she saying? Now I want you to think. Now the Prophet's saying this to Aisha and she's understanding what he's saying. That the first wife said that there's a meat on top of the mountain. The wife said, my husband like is like a mountain on which there is a valueless meat and I have to struggle so hard to get to that meat and then I have to come back and then I have to go back up like this okay now the jibal jibal means what in the Quran and in Arab, Arabic uh, literature jibal stands for stability wal jibal awtada right law anzalna hadha al Quran ala jabalin la ra'aytahu khashi'a in the same way Musa alayhi salatu wasalam he says uh, I want to see you Allah and Allah gives the, uh, the mountain because mountain was known to be firm it's stubborn it doesn't move right it is unmovable okay and what's interesting about the word jibal it has to also it is linked with the Arabic word jibilla which is the human nature right so this is one reason this is a very al good allegorical example of one type of husband he is very stubborn. And what she means that it's hard to climb up the mountain and get the meat from this mountain. What she means by this is that it's very hard to communicate with him. Right? It very, it's very hard to communicate with him and go to him and get something beneficial. To get something beneficial. So, uh, and so, uh, the first one, she is talking about, she's complaining what? The first one is complaining that she's not saying it in the ways we would say today, I can't communicate with my husband, but she's saying it in, in her, her way, uh, that in less words you can say more, that the example of my husband is like a mountain on which there is some valueless meat and I'm always struggling to go get that meat and it's, what it means is that it's very difficult for her to deal with his jabilla, it's very difficult for her to deal with his stubbornness it's very difficult for her to deal with communicating with him. Okay, so remember uh, we discussed the importance of communication in marriage. So it starts off with this, and a lot of the things you'll see, you'll see, we will come back and reflect a lot of the things that we had said, how they come back to this hadith. Okay, so the first is the uh, is the type of woman who complains. Okay, that uh, I can't communicate with my husband. The second one said, The second one basically says, Look, don't, I don't even want to talk about him. <laughs> then the ulama, they wrote, they wrote that she broke the promise because the women, they promised with each other what? We will not hide anything. We will say it the way it is. Okay. So the ulama, they, 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 they tried to debate, did she keep her promise that she made in the group or did she break that promise? Okay, but anyway, uh, She is saying that, uh, don't even mention him because if I start, I can't stop. And then I will have to mention all his bad qualities inside and outside. So this is what does this tell us uh, psychologically. There are two, three things. Number one, 
women sometimes, I've seen this happen a lot in marriage, is that, you remember how I was talking about before also, what women are giving and giving and giving and giving and they're not getting anything back. And what happens is, they come to a point where they don't feel like they can give anymore. In psychology we say, if you can feel it, you can heal it. If you can feel the pain, you can heal the pain. The first one is still able to express herself and still able to say, well, you know, he's like this mountain or this meat, right? As hard it is, she can still, what? Express, she has a understanding of the feelings she's feeling. But the second one is, uh, some people also said, you know, that maybe because she felt if she mentions, she can't, she'll start crying or, you know, she will express, she will go. So she's like, I'm just tired. And you know, in, in, in psychology, they also teach you that, do you know when, like, there are two people dating, husband and wife are together or boyfriend and girlfriend are together. Do you know at what point uh, you know that you're over someone and you're ready for the next relationship? It's when you no longer feel like you want to talk about them. As long as you are obsessed, and this is what I tell a lot of couples, that when a lot of couples come to me and they want divorce, but they can't stop talking about their husband or their wife. They just can't stop talking about their husband or wife. What does that tell me? You're not over. Because you really know you're over someone when you don't have the need to keep what? Talking, talking about them. And so, and this is one good thing. When you see somebody's no longer even interested about talking about their husband, or even interested in talking about their wife, then you can be pretty sure that it's out of mind, out of sight, it's done. Yeah, but as long as uh, she is hurt, because if you can feel it, you can heal it, right? As long as she's hurt, and she's expressing her emotions, it means you, it still can be fixed. So it shows, uh, and of course, only Allah and the Messenger and Aisha probably know what exactly the meanings of these wordings of the Prophet ﷺ are. For certainly a hadith like this that is very allegorical and uh, very metaphorical, uh, only Allah knows best. Okay? But she is saying that uh, don't tell me about him. If I talk about him, I'm just gonna, I'm just, I can't hold myself and I'm going to mention everything and uh, just it's better I don't talk. So the third one says, how many do we have to do? Eleven. So the first one was the mountain, right? Can't get the meat, can't communicate. Second one was, I'm so, so fed up. Okay, that I don't even want to talk about it, and if I talk about it, I'm just going to end up hurt even more. Okay. قَالَتْ ثَالِثَ زَوْجَتِي أَشْنَقْ Ashnaq means tall. Ashnaq means tall. And in Arabic language, being tall has a few meanings. Number one is that he's dumb. Right? <laughs> so being tall is a way of saying he's dumb. It's also a way of saying he is ill-mannered. Okay, so all of these things, and also ashnaq also means to be ugly. So all of these things, like when a building is tall, it's usually ugly. Like the taller a building gets, the more ugly it gets. So the third one says he's stupid, but what? He's stupid, but in antaka atrak. If I talk, he threatens to divorce me. And a lot of uh, uh, husbands. Uh, are like this, especially in certain communities, where if the wife says anything, the threat of divorce is always on top of her head, right? So she doesn't feel secure in that. She's always feels, and in the hadith in Sahih Tirmizi, it says that I feel like there's a sword always on top of me. I feel like what? There's a sword always on top of me that's just going to come. And she's like, I, I, I don't know when the whole, uh, the whole. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, it is. Uh, I am in a state as if I'm under a sharp sword. I do not know when my affair will come to an end. This is the wordings in uh, Sahih Tirmazi. Okay? And so, the third, uh, so, so this woman, she is saying he's stupider than me. And when I try to say something, then he threatens to divorce me. And then she says, uh, in antaqa atlaqa wa in askut uh, askatu a'laqa uh, a'laqa mu'allaqa uh, he just keeps me suspended 
If I just don't say anything, if I don't mind his business, if I don't try to uh, make him my project, if I don't try to help him in any, any way, just stay quiet, let him do whatever he wants, then I'm I'm a'laqa. I'm uh, just suspended. And by the way, in the Quran, very interesting point you may want to know is that keeping a wife in this state where she's mu'allaqatun, she is nor here nor there, is not allowed. And in fact, this was the reason the Prophet ﷺ, even though the Quran says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can divorce the, uh, that the Prophet ﷺ can divorce the, his wives and Allah will replace his wives with other wives. But the fact was that the Prophet could not divorce his wives. Because Ummahat al Mu'minin could not marry anyone else. And they would, not, they would be in a state of being mu'allaqa. They're nor married nor unmarried. So that's one reason the ulama, some of them, the scholars have said that the, the Prophet would have not ever uh, uh, divorced his wife. But Allah may have provided a way. But generally, as we know, within the Sharia, it would have not been allowed. Except that Allah would have made some way. So uh, the third one says, Zawjati ashnaq in antaka atlaka wa in askatu a'laka. So then I'm just in the middle. I'm nor it's like I'm not married to him, and uh, and uh, and uh, so in this case it's still better than the one uh, where you know the one who's fed up and the one who's going to the mountain. So how many have we done so out of eleven? Three. Now remember the prophet's trying to tell Aisha what about his love for her, and the way he does it is by mentioning the complaints women would generally have for men, right? And the Prophet's like, look at all these complaints. I don't fit in any of these, basically. This is what he's going to tell Aisha radiallahu anha, okay? So he says, uh, So the fourth one she says, Okay, Tahama is an area in Arabia. There are mountains of Tahama, as you know. And the night in that area is always, even though if the daytime is very hot, the night is always very cool. Okay? So her point is that he doesn't bother me. He's like a night in Tahama. He doesn't bother me. Then she says, uh, she says that he is nor hot on me. Nor is he hot-tempered, nor is he cold on me, nor is he bitter. Nor is there any cause of any fear from him to me. I don't feel any what? Fear from him. And I don't fear any injury to me. I don't feel any injury to me. So this is a state, she's not madly in love, right? But she is, you know, in uh, the hierarchy of needs, Maslow, what's the first one? Security, right? Safety and security. So she feels safe. She has nothing to fear. She knows her husband's not going to injure her. He's not going to try to hurt her. And she is contented with that. It's just like a good night. You can relax. If you want to look at it positively, you can enjoy the night very well. How many out of 11? Four. 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 Okay. And then... Uh, قالت خامسة زوجي إن دخل فحد وإن خرج أسد ولا يسأل عما أحد. She says the fifth one says my husband when he enters the house he's like a leopard and when he leaves the house he's like a lion and he doesn't ask concerning any of the affairs. He doesn't ask about anything. What is this now? This hadith. The ulama have given it two explanations. And we can consider both of them to be correct. Uh, one explanation is, one explanation is that when he comes into the house, he's like a leopard. When he comes in the house, he's like a leopard, meaning he's gentle. When he's in the house, he's gentle. And uh, he's like a lion when he leaves, means when he leaves the house, he's strong. When he leaves the house, he's strong. And if you remember the hadith, uh, the ayah in the Quran in Surah Al-Qasas, you know, when those two women that Musa alayhi salatu wasalam, 
Uh, and you know, the interesting thing about Musa, I don't know if I mentioned that here before or not, but the interesting thing about Musa is, Musa is always surrounded by women. You see, the beginning of the story is with his mother, then his sister, right? Then Imra'at al-Fir'aun, then the wife of Fir'aun raises him. Then after that, when he travels, those two women are there, right? And so when there, those two women are there, what happens? Uh, they, they go to their father and they describe him. And what do they say about him? Innahu laqawiyun ameen. So this shows women saying a quality of men that they appreciate, right? That he took their shepherds and uh, he took their sheep and, and, and their, their, their flock and he took them to drink the water well. And they say, Innahu laqawiyun ameen. He is strong, qawi, al qawi, and ameen, he's trustworthy. Okay, so this one, in this interpretation that I gave, in dakhala fahad, if he enters, he's like a uh, leopard. Okay, wa in wa in kharaja asad, and when he leaves, he's like a lion. So he's strong outside, and he's gentle inside. Inside the house, he's gentle. Outside the house, he's strong. And then she says, "Wala yusal amma ahad," and he doesn't. He doesn't concern. He doesn't ask about any of the uh, the buying and the and anything of the house. Okay. Now the other meaning of this hadith is when he's inside the house, he is he is causing fitna in the house, mischief in the house. He's like a leopard inside the house, causing angry inside the house, and so graceful and 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 so graceful outside that. Outside he's nice with everyone, but inside the house he is he is. Uh, very, um, he's, uh, he's, he's causing difficulty for everyone. And he doesn't ask anybody if anyone needs anything. He doesn't fulfill any of his promises. He doesn't keep any of his promises. He doesn't concern himself with the other, the other people in the household. Okay? So this is which number? Five. Five. In dakhala fahad wa in kharaja asad la yus'al amma ahad. Qalat sadisa. So the sixth one said, she, this, these fifth and sixth, they have difference of opinions amongst the the ulama. And uh, over here, I just want to mention the different opinions. So the fifth one says, "In uh, akala uh, is when my husband eats, he eats everything. When he drinks, he drinks everything." Okay. Uh, وَلَا يُولَجْ كَفُّ لِيَعْلَمُ الْبَحْثَ So, and he doesn't, con he doesn't concern himself with the affairs. Meaning, now this has two meanings too. One meaning is, if the wife gives him eggs, he'll eat eggs. If she gives him milk, he'll eat, drink them. He's not going to complain. Whatever he's given to eat, he eats it all. Whatever he's given to drink, he eats it all. He doesn't complain. The other meaning is, he eats it all and doesn't leave anything for his family. Okay? He, le he, he eats it all and doesn't leave anything for his family and he is not concerned with the affairs of the family. Okay. So this is which number? Six. Qalat sabi'ah zawjati ghayaya or ayaya tibaqa'a kullu da'in lahu So the next one she says that my husband is impotent. But she doesn't mean impotent in that sense. She means that he is not, in, he doesn't, he doesn't try to be intimate. Right? Like the Prophet ﷺ said, Mal'ab qabla jamil. Play before you enter. This is a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. So, uh, she says that he's impotent. And what? He has every disease, every, uh, every disease that could there be is in him. Every disease that could be is in this person. Then what else she says? كُلُّ دَاعٍ لَهُ دَاعٍ شَجَّكَ أَوْ فَلَّكَ أَوْ جَمْعَكَ لَكَ Or she says, and he beats my body or he'll beat my face or both. Okay, so here in, in, the, in, in, the, in, in this case we find what? That there's physical abuse. Okay, and he's just uh, you know going to her 
and just uh, having intimacy with her for himself only and then just when she doesn't when he is angry he'll just start uh, hitting her and this is you know in the muslim world this is common you know there're those and this is the thing women don't and this is what the one thing the prophet's trying to do here is that the prophet's trying to help women understand that what they should be appreciative of because they don't realize what other women go through that's one thing second is that the men should also know their flaws you know the flaws of all the men we should know what the flaws are and so then we can work on ourselves but women also don't realize that there's so many different types of husbands and because there's so many types of husbands it's very easy to be uh, ingrateful so both of these things are because the prophet's using their their complaints the complaints of these women to show Aisha how lucky she is basically you're lucky to be married to me is what the prophet's saying right the prophet's saying you're lucky to be married to me but on the same time the prophet's saying but you know what i know all the flaws i know this is a flaw that women will talk about i know this is a flaw women will talk about i know this is a flaw women will talk about and guess what i don't got nothing <laughs> i got no flaws right so he's he's doing he's doing this okay so uh see she says my husband is like impotent kullu da'in lahu Uh, he has every disease in him he hits me in my face in my body or both of them qalat thamina now this has been all negative mostly so far but from here and what's one thing that's interesting about this hadith it goes more from individual 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 more to social social the social aspect also begins to come into the picture so we're at what number so far 8 she says zawjati Uh, is my my husband is like the rayh is is like saffron is the smell of saffron he's and he is like al masul arna uh touching him is like touching a rabbit touching him is like touching a rabbit so in the first case you had just the sense of remember the uh, this which, which number was this where she said uh the number 4 said my husband is like the night of the hama he is nor hot nor nor bitter nor uh any fear from him nor any injury from him but she is now say, saying another parable he is like the smell of saffron and what uh, like a soft rabbit like the touch of the rabbit what does that mean he's he's also in addition to being safe he is also entertaining he can entertain me he keeps me occupied right you like to be around good smell and touching something soft and cuddly feels good okay so in addition to just being uh your safety net right he is also what able to what what do people do with rabbits they they play with them right and and you like to be around good smell so in addition to being a safety net he is also able to have what entertainment with with her okay Okay. So uh uh qalat tasi'a. Uh now uh, this uh th- this one uh sh- she uh this goes more to the social aspect, okay? She says the following. Now remember how the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said that you marry women for four reasons. for the best of it is if you marry for the deen but one of them is what is for her his high status his lineage okay his lineage he has a noble family noble lineage so this is being emphasized in this particular this one is which one nine right so everybody with me so far okay uh so she says uh قالت تاسع زوجتي رفيع العماد my husband's like a tall uh what can you say رفيع العماد my husband my husband is like uh, a high a uh, mad means building but what she means is high status okay رفيع العماد طويل طويل النجاد عظيم الرماد قريب البيت من النادي Okay so she says that my husband is of high status uh 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 and he is generous 
and he is hospitable. And he is near the house of Nadi. Nada, Dar Nadwa is like the place where you have the council of men. She means he's near the council, he's near the Nida, meaning he is a wise man. His, his advice is something people look, look for. His advice is someone, people look for his advice. He's, he's generous, he is of high status, he is, his advice is sought, he's someone important. Okay, so just like man can enjoy a female because of her high status, women can also what? Enjoy someone because of their high status. So this is, this is now the reverse of that hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu where the Prophet said one of the four reasons a man would marry a woman is for the status. In fact, that's one of the things the Prophet did when he married Khatija radiallahu anha, right? Okay, so this was number what? Nine. Nine. And in this she didn't complain. She, because overall she saw her benefit was more. She's living in a generous place and she is, you know, she is with a wise man that knows things, understands things, and he's generous with her, and, uh, and so on and so forth. Okay. Uh, then, قَالَتْ عَاشِرَ زَوْجَةِ مَالِكْ وَمَا مَا وَمَا مَالِكْ مَالِكْ خَيْرٍ خَيْرٌ خَيْرٌ مِنْ ذَلِكْ لَهُ he, She says, as for, um, my husband is Malik. So we don't know, is Malik his name or his quality? Meaning he's a possessor, he is ownership, okay? And what can I describe? She says, how can I tell you about Malik? Well, not Malik. He is more than all of these things that have been said. Everything said, everyone, anyone said anything before. Malik is more than all of this. Okay? So she says, Malik, وَمَا Malik, Malik, خَيْرُ مِنْ ذَلِكَ لَهُ إِبْلٌ كَثِيرَاتٌ والمبارك, uh, and then he, he continues, she, uh, she continues about Malik that, you know, he is more praiseworthy and she says, no matter how many words I say, it cannot uh, fulfill the uh, praise for him. He's so good and he has so many herds and he keeps his herd near the house. This is the main thing. He keeps his herd near the house. Why does he keep the, his herd near the house? Two reasons. Number one, if he goes out with his herd and flock, they will go in the morning and they won't come back till evening. evening. What she's trying to say is, he's so good to me that he tries to spend all his time with me. In fact, it says in here, if I can read it, uh, 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 it says over here, uh, yeah. إذا سمعنا صوت مزحر يقنا أنهن when this trumpet is sounded then the animals know that they're going to be slaughtered and the food instead of taking the sheep and everything to the food the food is brought to them and so what happens is Malik spends all his time with his wife so the other big complaint amongst wives is what you don't spend any spend any time. But the Prophet's giving it in this parable. He's not saying, well, he, the, the tenth one spent a lot of time with his wife, but rather he's saying he kept all his animals with him, even the food used to come to them, and when they would be slaughtered right over there. And the second meaning of that, that they would be slaughtered right over there, is that he is also very hospitable and very generous. So that also meaning is there. Okay. Now the eleventh one, this is where we wanted to really come. So all of this is being mentioned to come to this. Now this story, I have to tell it to you in this, in, in this way. Actually, let me just use this uh, commentary here. Uh, I'm just going to read the translation because I want it to really affect you. So the eleventh one is the one that the Prophet will now comment on. So he doesn't comment on any of them. He only comments on the eleventh one. The 11th one. So, Umm Za'ra said, this is what the hadith is known, the hadith of Umm Za'ra said, my husband was Abu Za'ra. So, Umm Za'ra and Abu Za'ra were, were husband and wife. And how can I praise Abu Za'ra? How can I praise him? He made my ears bow with tools. Okay? So, he is just, 
He just adored her. Okay? My ears bow with jewels. He made my sides full of fat. The way it was thought is that, you know, guys should be lean and skinny. Girls should... That was the, the model of beauty uh, in those days. In the days of the Prophet. Even if you remember the hadith of the, uh, the necklace, where the necklace was lost and Aisha was not in her... Uh, you know what she says. She says uh, her aib, her, her, her one of her aibs was that she had gotten skinny, and so when they lifted the thing, they didn't notice she was not there. Do you know what the event I'm talking about? Because she had gotten skinnier, they didn't even notice she's not there, and so she thought of that in the hadith of Sayyid Bukhari. She thought of that as like an aib against her, like oh my God, you know I've gotten so skinny. So this is, uh, you know, so this was. Uh, so, uh, he, he made my sides by, fe by feeding full of fat. He kept me so happy and contented that due, that due to self-admiration and haughtiness, because he kept me happy, what happened as a result? I became, I almost took him for granted, right? I fell into self-admiration and haughtiness. And I thought I was virtuous, meaning I thought I deserved this. Okay? I thought I deserved all this. But he was just trying. And remember what we said about men are hungry to show what? Men are hungry to show love. Right? Men are hungry to express love. So just keep that in mind. He found me from such a poor home that lived with me, that lived with me hardship, owning only a few goats for a living. From there he brought me into such a prosperous family who owned horses camel, oxen for plowing, gardeners, and possessed all types of wealth. Besides this, he was so good-natured. He did not criticize me or scold me for anything. Just watch. I slept till late in the morning. No one was allowed to wake me up. Food was so abundant that after filling myself, I just left it. The mother of Abu Zara. So now she's, she described her husband, Abu Zara. Now she's describing the mother of Abu Zara. In what manner can I praise her? Her huge utensils were always full. Meaning she was always willing to give to her daughter-in-law. No matter what. Take, take, take. She loved her mother-in-law. Her house was very spacious. Meaning she was very generous and she was willing to give. The son of, of Abu Zara, the son, uh, their son, she says. In what manner can I praise him? He was also light upon light. Nurun ala nur. He was so thin and skinny, and the sleeping part of his, uh, 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 this, uh, he was like, you know, he was, he was, uh, you can say fit. Okay. And then she says. Uh, a side of the lamb was enough to fill his stomach. And so on and so forth. And then she says, uh, The daughter of Abu Zara, how can I praise her? And then she praises her. Then she says, The servant of Abu Zara, how can I praise her? And then she praises her. And she says, She obeys, uh, no, the daughter, she says, to, uh, She obeys her mother and father. She is fat among the Arabs. It is desirable that man be thin and, oh, you know, so on and so forth. And then she says, how about the slave of Abu Zara, the girl, the slave girl? She never gossiped about our house affairs to anyone. She did not use foodstuffs without permission. She did not let the house become dirty or untidy, but kept it clean. So this is, she's explaining her love for Abu Zara is so much. She doesn't only love Abu Zara, but she is so happy, not just with him, but also with the family members. But remember what she said in the beginning. She said that I was enjoying it so much that I became huh, proud. So what happened? Abu Zara, the husband, left the house one day and saw another woman playing with her children. And he decided to divorce Abu uh, Umm Zara and marry the other girl. The one he found in the streets. But she's not, she, but she's still, despite this, praising him. Because she remembers now, you know how in Sharia it says that if a wife and a, a man are married, 
She cannot marry her first husband until she marries another one. Why? Because so that she can appreciate what? She can appreciate what she had. So this hadith is also uh, advising women, but it's also telling men all of their flaws. It gives a list of all the flaws that are possible for men also. But it is also ending here with this. Then she married, Abu Muzara married a soldier. She married what? A soldier. So she says, uh, He loved her so much that he divorced me, married her. Okay? And then, consequently, I married another chief and soldier. A nobleman who was a prince and soldier. So she married now another man. He showered on me many gifts. And from each type of animal he gave me. He, used, he said to me, eat as much as you want yourself. Send it to your, pa your parents as much as you wish. That this is a fact. If I add up all his good qualities. Who? The soldier. If I add up all his good qualities... Then too he will not excel in the little thing that Abu Za'ra bestowed upon me. <clears throat> so, she's now married to this man, and she's now not hiding anything, right? <laughs> so, she's saying, that relationship that I had with that man was not, if my husband gave me everything, it's equal to even a small amount, that, that first marriage that I had. Now, what is, what the Prophet said now, this is the climax of the story and the point of the story and then we'll go back and review the, the flaws of men and also the lesson for women in this hadith. And that is that uh, the Prophet then says to Aisha radiallahu anha, he says to her that I am also, so after mentioning all of these, his point of saying it was, I am also to you as Abu Zara was as um, to Ummu Zara. Zara. But he says, I will not divorce you. He says to Aisha, I love you the same way they loved each other, except what? I will not. I will not divorce you. Meaning, perhaps one of the meanings is that means that Aisha, you know, as the threat had already come in the Quran also. In Talakna Hunna, right? So Aisha knew about this. But the point here is then Aisha also responds to the Prophet and she says, O Messenger of Allah, uh, she says, You are more to me, you, you are much more to me than him. Meaning, my love for you is more than the love uh, Abu Dha'ra had for Umu Dha'ra. So this is the entire hadith of the Prophet wasallam on this issue. Now, let us go back and uh, uh, just uh, evaluate uh, the flaws of the men and uh, the lesson for the women. But we will go over... The first one was which one? Jibat. Jibat, the mountain. He doesn't communicate. Ten minutes. Oh, I have only... Okay. So inshallah, I will finish quickly. Second one, she says, I, don't, I just can't say anything. I have no energy and, you know, I just don't want to talk about it. Third one says, he's ugly, ill-mannered, and he is controlling. He always has a sword on top of me. What is this known as? Emotional abuse. Right? You're walking on eggshells. You don't know what you'll do and something ang he will do something angry. Uh, the fourth one was Laylatul Tahama. Huh? The night that's secure. The night that's security. The fifth one was the lion and the leopard example. And so that it has both good and positive. He's gentle inside and strong outside, as we mentioned. Or he creates a fuss inside the house, but he's nice with everyone outside the house. Sixth is he's basically selfish and he doesn't care to give intimacy. Actually, I think one of them I forgot to uh, mention. <coughs> Huh? The one who eats and drinks everything. Okay, the one he eats and drinks everything and he doesn't go to bed with her. He sleeps in his own sheets. I didn't clarify that. So, And then, uh, then there's the one who uh, is um, no intimacy. She said he's impotent and he, what, he hits her. Right? 
And the next one is entertaining, kind, and gentle, the rabbit. Okay, Safran and the rabbit. The next one is he has a social status, he has, a, you know, he's generous and he's wise. And so what is the Prophet also saying here is that there are different types of men, right? And they have different qualities. Sometimes the quality is their wiseness. Sometimes the quality is their gener generosity. Sometimes they're, they're, they have different... And in fact, uh, there's a book written. It's called uh, The Five Ways of Loving. And uh, it talks about one of the ways of loving is to give attention to someone. Time. To give them what? Time. One way to love someone, especially for men, is to give gifts. Right? Women like gifts for men. To give them, shower them with gifts. Right? The another other way is to show them touch and intimacy. Right? That's another way to show that you love someone. Another way is to show, uh, to give words of appreciation. Right? You know, you can do whatever you like and so on and so forth and give words of appreciation. The fifth one I don't remember right now, but inshallah we'll discuss it in one of our other lectures. We have to finish up quickly. And uh, the tenth one was, he tries to give her time. Right? He keeps all the animals close, so he doesn't have to go anywhere far. He tries to give her time. So like I said, it goes from the individual more into the social aspect, talking about uh, the generosity with others and so on and so forth. And then the last one was the Umm and, uh, and, uh, and then how the Prophet commented on the, the, uh, on the 11th one. And so the lesson uh, for the men is that these are some of the key things. Try to give them time. Try to be generous with them, try not to be strict with them, try to be intimate with them, try to, um, try to not be stubborn with them, uh, try not to frustrate them to the point that they are, get fed up, try not to you know, be entertaining with them, be generous with them, all of these lessons that we just learned in this hadith. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us the best of men and give us maru, marura, is it marua? Marua. marua. Chivalry, chivalry. You know, men that are that are strong and gentle. The same, right? Marua, men that are strong and gentle, uh, and and uh, and of course, uh, you know, there is this allegory that the Prophet sallallahu uses for himself and Aisha to describe the love that they both had. But no, I'm going to finish. Inshallah.